I'm muted. It's Thursday, 4 p.m. Central. I'm Fred McMurray, which means this must be... All right, I feel better. I got to rock out. Hi, Kristen. Hi, Fred. Welcome, everyone, to yet another episode of Pillars of Franchising. Yes, and, and as Meg message, I was really feeling the music there. I love that. So, okay. Sorry, I'll focus on franchising and not music. Um, I'd rather do music. Never mind. So, what's happening in the franchising land? I know we got... I know we're going to have... IFA updates out the wazoo because that's been happening. But in the yeah. non-IFA world, for the, the little dude on the street that is trying to decide what to buy, if he should buy a franchise, if it's a good time now. And I know Jerry's going to say it's always a good time later, so we don't have to worry about that. But tell us, what's happening in the world of franchising, Kristen? Well, there's all kinds of stuff going on in the world of franchising. And I would tell you that it is, yes, I will still Jerry Slender. It is still a good time. Um, there's a lot of kind of hubbub going on with uh, QSR magazine and a lot of the franchise models in restaurants right now with um, sales kind of teetering on a downward turn with a few of the restaurant models because prices are starting to, um, well, they have been really going up. And so I think what we're seeing in some cases in some models is as prices go up, um, the breaking point for customers is starting to kind of teeter just a little bit. And I think that we're going to see that. Um, I'm hoping that we don't start to see an all out downslide um, because that affects everybody. Right. But not not unlike we had happened back in 08, 09. Um, eventually, you get to a point when you have markets with big layoffs where people have to decide, you know, if you're paying, we went out to buy eggs the other day. I'm out in California, it was like $5 for a dozen of eggs. Come on, right? Like, if I have to pay $5 for a dozen of eggs, I may not pay $14 for a sandwich. It, there's just a breaking point. So um, hopefully things will get turned around here, and it's not hitting every industry the same. Um, but there is some of that, and I don't think people should panic. I don't think that's quite the issue at all. Um, if you're looking to buy a franchise, I think you should look at more recession resistant franchises look at services look at things that um people need and also with that look at markets that are still doing strong right so, so i yeah. i remember when i was a kid mcdonald's um uh thing was change back from your dollar and yeah. now it seems like it's change back from your 50. <laughs> they don't accept 50 dollar bills where i live <laughs> okay. at least the sign says that now you almost have to give them a 50 because it's well over 20 but it used to be you know we don't accept hundred dollar bills now you don't accept fifty dollar bills but um yeah it's kind of crazy it's it's certainly gotten more but i will tell you along the lines you know i'm the big um iced tea drinker from mcdonald's that's my jam um you have to get their app fred that's really the the key to saving money at mcdonald's is you have to order off the app so um, Michelle I, I do has think franchising is still a great a great avenue for people to go. You'll, you'll hear a lot about IFA and some of the great things that the International Franchising Association is looking to do, not here, not only here in the States, but internationally. Um, you'll hear from Fred and Andrea, and we've got a great guest today who's been here since really the beginning of the show. Um, she's been a president for our brand and president for another brand currently. Um, just really... It's going to be a great show today, so I'm excited to get started. I'm I'm excited to have Meg on because she was our second guest, and, and she's been on multiple times. So, you know, she actually helped make us what we were. So it's great to have her on for the five-year anniversary year, month, whatever you're going to get. So at that point, I'm going to shut up and other than say, yeah, I don't want a food franchise. What's a decent service area franchise to buy into or at least service vertical to buy into? Well, you said the word service, right? I mean, I mm -hmm. think the one thing we know, and this is true when I worked in the retail service sector of home improvements, I mean, I, that one is something that people, 
you know, you always have to have heat. You always have to have plumbing, right? Some of the core things like that, um, I think, are really critical. Look at the things that people can't go without. Um, those are things that I would always stick with. I mean, my brand is something that people can always clean their own house if they have to. But no one um, wants to clean their a, own toilet. <laughs> Some people won't do it. But if I, if I had to choose all over again, you know, those are the recession-proof businesses. And we used to say at Home Depot, you know, if the economy is going well and people are buying new houses, there's still stuff they're going to need or want to put in those houses. And if the economy is in the tank and they're not buying new houses, they have to fix up the old ones to keep them working. So that was one of those sectors that no matter what, there was still business going on in there. And so I think that you know, I am a firm believer in the whole home improvement sector. That's just what I've grown up in doing. And it's proven to me over the last 40 years now that that's a, a strong, sturdy, stable area. So. All right. So now, in honor of yesterday's International Women's Day thingy, Woo-hoo. we'll bring on one of the the second woman to help us put us over the top. Hi, Meg. Hey, Kristen. Good to uh, good to be back with you guys. I can't believe it's been five years. That's absolutely crazy. Great for you guys that you have this incredible trajectory and you've built an audience and a following. That's a lot of fun. There's so many people who um, should learn about franchising from people who've been in it directly, who are working in it as consultants and as owners and as founders. So it's really a terrific service that you provide. Well, thank you. For the people who haven't been on or haven't listened to the show all this time, can you take a minute and introduce yourself? Because you know, you've done so much in the franchising industry, so much for people who have owned franchises. And I don't want to certainly do you a disservice by missing anything. Could you please give our listeners a brief? Well, I'll I'll okay. keep it short. You know, I'm always told you just got to describe yourself quickly and get on to what others are all about. Um, I've been in franchising about 17 years. I was lucky to meet some great people um, early in my career in franchising who gave me a shot at things I wasn't expecting um, outside of marketing, and that's specifically leadership. So I've had the opportunity to lead the Molly Made brand with you for um, 12 or 15 years, seems like a long time ago. Um, And just about four years ago, transitioned over into beauty and wellness, where I'm leading the Lash Lounge, uh, founded by Anna Phillips. And I've had a lot of opportunity um, to get involved some with SCOA, uh, which was founded by Andrea uh, Mundy, who's here on with us today as well. So um, a lot of experience in leadership, but honestly, my real passion um, is not about what I do. It's about what the franchisees do. And that's have the courage to make a decision, take a leap and get into business uh, with a franchise or I think pretty much any and every category in franchising is still a great bet. So I still love food franchising. I love health and wellness. I love service. I really appreciate and respect all of it because it creates a model to assist someone to provide the back office support, the coaching. And that really helps anyone who's looking to be an entrepreneur. So maybe some uh, categories are hotter than others at different times, but I think they're also worthy. Absolutely. Absolutely. So obviously I'll kind of kick us off and then Andrew, I'm going to let you kind of Mm -hmm. take over for a bit. Um, The big transition, right. From uh, Andrew and I were laughing uh, from cleaning toilets to doing lashes. Right. And for people who don't know you, you are the most down to earth, pure, simple, yet just gorgeous person inside and out. How do you make that transition from toilets to lashes? Well, you're you're way too generous, um, but I'll take the compliment. Thank you. Um, I am kind of simple. Um, I'm laughing because Andrea, I feel lucky, has become a friend <laughs> just like you, uh, Kristen, and your husband have become friends to me. That's that's really the real reason I love franchising. It's such a great community. Um, but yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't know how to clean my house. Let's be honest. I was, I was leading the brand and I loved, um, learning about how to make the service better. Uh, but I'm, I'm terrible at cleaning my house. I still have Molly made service today. Thanks to John Cohen and the ownership here in Southeast Michigan. Um, but I also know nothing about makeup and Andrea pulled me aside a couple of years ago and, you know, she's looking at me in the mirror, just, you know, thinking, what am I going to do with this girl? And so she's got me into wearing lip gloss now. And and now I'm wearing eyelashes and I'm kind of into it. It's sort of fun, but it was not natural for me. I really wish we brought that photo. Um, That would have been 
I don't know. I'd be a little afraid to give it to Fred, but there <laughs> is a photo of the first time Meg wore lip gloss yeah. at an IFA show. I think it was. It was, a big, <laughs> it was a really big deal. But, I, you know, now it's funny. I think, well, the way I was raised was to put very little emphasis on your external appearance. And that's not because we shouldn't celebrate it. It's just that, you know, in our house, it was every minute in the mirror is 10 minutes in a book. And I hate to read. So I just didn't want to spend a lot of time in the mirror. Um, but it is really empowering to feel good about yourself on the inside and the outside, whether that's physical fitness or mental health, you know, yoga, lashes, you name it, it all, it all plays a role in how we wake up and smile. And that's how we're going to project to others and how we're going to treat them. So I'm kind of into it now. I've got countertops covered with product, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars of Andrea Scoa products, which are my full routine now. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I, I love that. And not, I, I love what you said at the end, because I think, you know, you've really embraced, I think, you know, when I transitioned out of SCOA and knew that it was going to be in the hands of, at least in part, you, that felt very reassuring to me, because to me, SCOA was never really meant to be a beauty brand. It was meant to be a self-esteem brand. Um, you know, it was really just about teaching people things that, are very fundamental in how we feel about ourselves and part of our wellness. And so I love that you said that we joke about lip gloss, but Hey, it makes you feel good too. Right. So it's okay. Healthy skin, you know, yeah. healthy habits and, and SCOA is such an incredible brand and it really is about healthy skin. We don't say beautiful skin because people can have skin that's in different conditions and it can still be beautiful, but it's healthy for them. That's really what we care about in the ethos of what Andrea created. So that really is um, what this industry that I'm in today is about. It's about wellness and self-confidence and self-esteem, as you said, Andrea. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I have a question actually that I hope it's okay to jump in with, with being on the heels of, of Women's Day yesterday and yeah. I always struggle a bit with, you know, wanting to create like this really inspirational post or something. And I, I, I love that, you know, my favorite thing that I saw about Women's Day was was something that um, actually someone that's now working, I think, in the Lash Lounge posted. And knowing that, you know, I was able to make some kind of impact on another woman in her career was very meaningful for me. And then another post that my daughter made about just sort of how she saw me as a mom and obviously, um, uh, you know, a woman, but you have definitely, I mean, everyone I know in this industry talks about you and, and, you know, I struggle a bit when I hear the word, she's a female, this, like why we have that word female in front, I don't know. But the yeah. reason at this stage is not to be derogatory. I don't think, I think it's because it is still unusual that, you know, you have women or people in the positions that you've held. Um, that's not as common as I think it had been in the past. And maybe that's changing a little bit. So, uh, you know, the common question would obviously be, you know, how would, what would you say to inspire other women following in, in your footsteps? But I actually want to ask it a little bit differently sure. because I know you are a mom of boys. And so I wanted to ask you, you know, what do you talk to your boys about in terms of what their part is in ensuring that women who deserve to be at the tables that, you know, you've been able to be a part of and worked your way to be there for, like, how would you advise them in supporting that effort? Yeah, that's a great question, Andrea. And I know you're a mother of four, two boys and two girls. So you have that unique perspective of advising um, both, both genders. I'll tell you what, I don't think it's what I say to my kids. I think it's what I show them. If I show them how important work ethic is, I show them how I seek to balance their interests and my interests. I show them how I respect everyone. I treat everyone with respect, whether it's the biggest franchisee or the most powerful person at IFA or someone I've just met on the vendor floor. And I've traveled with my children for a decade. Kristen can um, yes. speak to that. I've taken them <laughs> to every convention when they were young boys so that they could see how you behave, how you treat people, how you respect one another. So if you see that, you absorb it, you shouldn't really have to tell them. I mean, there's a funny story with my kids where 
I teach them manners. And I'm like, you hold the door for your mother. You hold the door for a lady. I think chivalry is still important. And they'll walk in a restaurant when they were young and they didn't hold the door for me. And they're looking around ready to order that $10 McDonald's burger. And I'm not there because I'm just standing outside. Yeah. Like wait for him to come back and come back and open the door. And you know how many times that happened twice because yeah. they learned. And so they understand how important our roles are in the working world, in the relationship world. And that's from bearing witness as opposed to kind of directing them. This is how you should do it. And so I want them to see it and then do it. Well, I want to um, remind our viewers, because we've got a lot of viewers out there today, um, that if you'd like to call in or chat, you can chat with us on our website. And if you want to call in, our number is 323-580-5755. Again, that's 323-580-5755. And Meg, I want to, you know, I think this is really, a, you were a really great example, um, not only for you, but, you know, uh, the Guptas were always really good at it. Um, yeah. The great thing about franchising and people who franchise and have children to bring your kids to these events, what a family event. And what's really cool, and we've talked about this with Jerry, is that then the second generation grows up in franchising and they're connected and they have friends. So as the second generation comes into these positions, they already have this network of friends who wind up winds up taking over mom and dad's business or they're somewhere in association with a franchise system. It's been really interesting to watch as these, your boys just kill me. I look at them now on Facebook and I'm like, oh my gosh, they were like so little when they used to come. Right. And so, yeah, now they're grown. Yeah. It's, it really is. We call it the franchise family and it's really amazing. And as a leader that made you that much more accessible to the team mm. of franchisees that you led. And I think that that's a really human element that you brought to the team that a lot of other leaders don't necessarily do. So I think that made it really great. How do you- If I, if I may, I wanna turn back to um, the question you asked though, Andrea, because it just occurred to me, you know, we're talking about International Women's Day and sort of how I, I feel about that, but bringing together the two ideas of, of taking your children places and letting them observe things Is there any better way to do that than in franchising? Because if you think about the diversity of ownership in this business, you know, if you go to a Molly Maid convention or you go to a Lash Lounge convention or a Pizza Hut convention, the franchisees are going to come from all corners of the country. They're going to be, you know, all different religions, all different backgrounds. And I'm just a big believer in all diversity and equity and inclusion, and that includes women. And so if you can get your children exposed to that kind of thing, I mean, what a wonderful way for them to see how many people can participate in, you know, this great nation's business. Mm -hmm. How How do you, Meg, how do you suggest, I mean, obviously now you've got Lash Lounge that you're leading and we've talked a lot in the last, um, few shows and obviously Elizabeth and I are on the board at the Titus Center, the advisory board. Um, and we've got a lot of young people who are now interested, you know, in oh, 30 years of age, they want to build these empires, right? How do you look to attract the younger generation into franchising? Well, it's interesting. You know, I think, first of all, everyone wants to build an empire right out of college and it just doesn't happen that way. I'd love to try to (laughs) recalibrate the young people today and say, you know, the part of the fun of building your career is the building, you know, it's the, it's the doing it. It's not having instant overnight success. You don't, you don't learn as much if you don't have a few failures. More and more, though, there are university programs. In fact, today I was looking at the Babson College Program for Entrepreneurship, and I think uh, the VP of Lash Lounge, Kristen Kidd, is starting to uh, try to find a way to assist there. There's obviously, um, I think it's the University of Louisville that's got a program. Here in Michigan, um, we have, goodness, it's going to escape me, um, a, a university just a little north of Flint um, that also has a great franchising program. So There's a lot more legitimacy in the franchising industry for curriculum in a traditional undergraduate setting. And I think that's a great way to encourage young people who are collegiate bound to think about franchise ownership. And and separate and aside from that, there are a lot of franchise organizations, particularly in 
services um, who focus on the trade, certainly, um, you know, working for Neighborly for many years, they're always looking for young people who are getting into the trades and then trying to help those young people transition into business ownership, because that's a great way to get into owning a service-based uh, service-based franchise. So there's so many opportunities. It's not, it's not just through your parents anymore. You know, you can yeah. start weaving your way into that in your early 20s. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually a great point. I mean, there is definitely um, a big movement, especially in in Canada where I'm based, um, where you know the the trades are really where there's there's almost a, a, a much bigger push to create more programming and create more incentive um, because we just don't have enough people working in the trades. So um, I really like what you said there. I hadn't really thought about you know, incorporating franchising into that because there is kind of a gap. You come out of that with some kind of a certification to be able to go and run a business when that's kind of where you've spent your time and your focus. Those are two very different skill sets. So a franchisor can really kind of amplify and scaffold that experience for you rather than, you know, having you sort of think that for the rest of your life, you're, you're in electrician work or whatever. Yeah, I mean, sort of focused on. perfectly said, look, most of the trades, um, I feel like I'm just winding my way back in time here, but most of the <laughs> trades, you do a pretty long apprenticeship. And, you know, you go through trade school to become a journeyman, plumber, electrician, all these fabulous careers where you can make a great living, but you don't learn to run a business. So in franchising, we kind of need the same apprenticeships within franchise ownership, you know, a way for someone to convert from being their own business to a franchise business. So, you know, lots, lots to discover there. Mm -hmm. What about you, you bring up a really good point as we talk about these trades and these apprenticeships, Um, obviously running the lash lounge. um, Do you have a training, a training system in place for ladies or gentlemen who want to learn how to do lashes? I mean, do you have to be in the we do, Kristen, and I'm so glad you asked because in the in the aesthetics industry, in the beauty and cosmetology industry, traditional cos schools are really focused on hair because the styling of hair, the science of hair color, I mean, it's really intense stuff. The young women and men I've met over the last four years are so impressive with their skills and their emphasis. And in this industry, it's become a lot more common for people to, and not surprisingly, but people to find the thing they really are passionate about. You know, if you're a, if you're a skilled tradesman, you probably aren't, you know, as interested in being a handyman as you are interested in being like the best plumber. Well, it's really not that different in cosmetology and aesthetics. If you love skincare, you want to be doing skincare. You don't also want to do nails and hair. So we've discovered that there's a lot more interest in single service beauty. Thus, we have SCOA Facial Shops, which is skincare only. Thus, we have the Lash Lounge, which is eyelashes only. Uh, We're launching a brand, Sugaring LA, which is only hair removal services. And the women and men who work there really are the best of the best in that particular service. And lashes being, in my opinion, the hardest service to find access to great training. There's incredible training in aesthetics and learning how to be a great esthetician. And I think the same is true for hair removal, but in lashing, you know, maybe it's two hours of a 400 hour curriculum. That's where we come in. And by we, I mean, Anna Phillips, because she's the one who has developed what I would consider the nation's best training curriculum for a lash artist. And we provide that training to the lash artists who work for the lash lounge. We expect them to stay with us for a year or more. And they do because they're making great money, but we turn out the best of the best. So if you can go to a hotel and learn lashing in three hours Um, that's not the Ivy league of lashing. The Ivy league is coming to a lash lounge where the, the proprietary training was designed by Anna Phillips. You can't, you can't beat that. And we provide that for free to our trainees. So, you know, we feel like we kind of are the apprenticeship to developing, you know, the incredible lash artists and really upping, um, the respect for this industry by being the ones who've trained, um, more lash artists than anybody else. So where do you find your candidates then? Do you go to, do you find them that come out of cosmetology schools that just kind of want to change their direction a bit? Yeah, it's, that's a great question. It's, it's hard. Um, and it's hard for a few reasons because the mindset is, 
you finish cosmetology school and you go into hair. And as I said, most of the young people who are finishing cos school have barely been introduced to lashing. So there's sort of two opportunities. We're either finding people right out of cosmetology school, which we love because they haven't learned any bad habits. And rather than being an apprentice and sweeping hair in a salon and waiting three years for a chair, they come right in and work in our really, really pristine, beautiful salons where they have great customers who tip them exceptionally well and will train them end to end. It's either that type um, of potential stylist or it's somebody who's been in beauty and is starting to pay attention to TikTok and to Instagram and going, you know, everybody's putting lashes on and magnetics and so forth. And word of mouth, you start to hear honestly about um, the career opportunity. And by career, I mean, you know, comfortable, successful, high income. And that's how we're attracting um, more stylists. And we're really, really happy to provide the type of career that gives people not a living wage. <laughs> it's not a living wage. It's a great way to make a living. And that I'm really, really proud of. Well, I'm told that we need to go to commercial, but when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about how we came out of COVID with a service like this, because obviously we were heavily impacted. We talked about that in the past, but then really what it takes to get into a lash lounge um, financially and who your ideal candidate is in a day in the life. Yep. Love to. I'm going to talk about all three brands. Awesome. Let's go off to commercial. Then we'll be right back with more Pillars of Franchising. As usual, thank you for joining Pillars of Franchising. We appreciate every single one of you. Um, We want to give a shout out to our sponsors, the Titus Center for Franchising at Palm Beach Atlantic University. You can find them on the college's website. Also, Franchise Show 247, which can be found at FranchiseShow247.com. And we couldn't do without our sponsors and we appreciate their support. Don't forget, we love to have call-in guests. Our number to call in is 323-580-5755. That is 323-580-5755. If you have questions for our guests or for any of our Million Dollar Mentors, we welcome you to call in at any time on the show. We will do our very best to answer your calls. Stay tuned. More coming up. And thank you for that, Elizabeth. All right, Meg, let's get down to nuts and bolts now. Yeah, absolutely. Fire away. Okay. So who's your ideal candidate to buy a lash lounge? Like I don't need to be an esthetician or do hair. Definitely not. You don't need to be an esthetician. You don't need to even be familiar with the beauty industry. Of course, we love people who are passionate about customer service. We love people who are passionate about (laughs) making their guests feel great. We love franchisees who are excited about creating a great career center and a career opportunity for the young people who are going to work for them. Uh, For me, it's absolutely imperative that the type of folks that we bring into any of our three brands are highly respectful of their employees and of their members and guests. It's just got to be there. Of course, I'm sure everybody would say that, but I really feel that, you know, we're in an intimate service, personal service there's a lot of competition in, in beauty, health, and wellness, and you have to deliver the goods. You've just got to sincerely care about your employees, sincerely care about how they're feeling about their training and the opportunity to provide great service, and then they'll provide it. So for me, it's really all about the attitude mm-hmm. of the franchisee. Of course, they need to be financially qualified. We can train them to run a business. You should be excited about being in an industry that makes people feel good. um, And that is rather turnkey. It's not complicated. There's not a lot of inventory in any of our three businesses, Lash Lounge, SCOA Facial Shops, or Sugaring LA. SCOA Facial Shops a little bit more because we sell a lot of great product, but you don't have complex stuff like vehicles that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars or, you know, food and restaurants that cost millions of dollars to build. This is um, largely a a turnkey way of getting into business in what is an incredibly high demand category. There is no going out of style uh, with business. I'm a perf or with beauty. I'm a perfect example, right? I did nothing. And now I pretty much do everything in the course of four years time. (laughs) I I love what you said about um you know, identifying candidates that have, you know, this respect for not just their employees, but also the members and that there's an intimacy to the services you provide. How do you assess that in the, you know, stage of sort of getting to know a franchisee? 
Yeah. So good. I don't want to give away my secrets because then if a candidate <laughs> watches this, they're going to know. But you know what? If a candidate is, if a candidate watches this, that means they're really interested in learning about franchising. So good on them that they get the secrets. It's not unlike what I do with my kids, Andrea. It's it's the same observation, right? At this stage in my career, I've had hundreds and hundreds of these dinners and hundreds and maybe thousands of CEO calls. I'm really trying to get at the heart of what motivates somebody. So if the conversation is immediately all about money and we're all in the business of business and we need to make a profit, so I'm not dismissing how important that is, but what comes first? How interested are they? Maybe even just hearing a little bit about me because I always start with questions about the candidate, their family, where they're from. I want to see if they're the get to know you type because that's so important in the customer service industry. I'm super observant. So during dinners, during lunches, I'm looking to see how they're treating the wait staff at a restaurant. I'm paying attention to whether or not they're greeting our executive assistants who are helping them with their luggage. So I'm watching the whole thing because I already know they have enough money. I already know they're interested. I want to know if they're going to be well-liked and if they're going to respect the team members that are so precious to us here at the home office and if their fellow franchisees are going to like them. So- Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's a popularity contest, not at all, but I'm saying it's really imperative that you pick very, very carefully when you're selecting people to represent your brand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's a, those are great. Those are great examples. I think it's that social intelligence to be able to, you know, read the room when they have customers yeah. in with different needs and sometimes those needs are unspoken. So I think that's great insight. Meg, I had, Beautifully said. I had a great question. Um, I'll call it from the peanut gallery since it's from Jerry. (laughs) Do you allow franchisees to buy two or three of those brands of the three brands to build kind of like a beauty center if you want to do it in the same strip mall? Yeah. You know, we haven't had that yet, but I do have this like incredible fantasy about somebody wanting to buy all three. And and there's a few reasons for it. Number one, I love all three services and you could just quickly go back and forth and have all three appointments and just, you know, Zen out for the day. But also because the more I spend time with our stylists and our skincare coaches, the more I hear them say, you know, I would like to have a little bit of an opportunity to just do facials once a week or a facialist is saying, really would love to learn lashing. And if we have great people feel this way about the home office staff, I'll do anything not to lose them. You know, if I've got to move them to a different position, I'm always trying to move the pieces around to keep people happy who are producing and and a great part of our industry. So I'd love to think that somebody might want to do that and, uh, you know, be able to even move some of their employees around. So, Hey, I'll put it out there. If we, if we have someone listening, who's interested in opening all three, um, I'll make you a deal because I can do that. So that would be fun. (laughs) Yeah. I'm telling you, I think that is an amazing idea. I mean, oh my gosh. And Jerry, I can see smoke coming out of his ears already. The rest of you can't, but I can't. So um, I think that's an amazing idea. And, you know, as we as we close out the interview, I, I have to give you a huge shout out because not not a lot of people know this about you, but I have to give you a huge shout out for your leadership because um, our the Molly made team, a lot of them, as we evolved, we lost a lot of the support structure mm-hmm. and a humongous um accolade for your leadership is that they followed you. And I think it is so great because really, you know, people don't leave companies as much as they leave leaders. And it is a huge compliment to you in the way that you respect and treat your employees when people follow you where you go. And so I just want to publicly say, I think it's amazing and you should be so proud of yourself at how well you treat people that work for you to have an entire team. And I know you don't solicit it. That's not what it's about. That's not who you are, right? But they know where they are going to thrive and you create that environment. And I think that's really fantastic. So happy International Women's Day to you (laughs) and the leadership that you have provided to all of those wonderful people. Well, that's, that's really kind, Kristen. I, um, you know, I, I do love team building and I do love leading um, people. And I, I happen to lead really great people. So I do feel blessed that 
Uh, many of the, the folks I've worked with in the past have also transitioned uh, to where I am today. And I think that, you know, change is hard for everybody when there's new management and there's yeah. um, different opportunities. And we had such a great run um, at Service Brands with such a great group. And we had a really good run, many of us, in a few years in transition uh, yeah. with Neighborly. I certain, certainly learned a lot uh, from Mary Thompson leading me there. And, you Absolutely. know, when when a door opens, it opens. And it's uh, it's always great to be able to uh, to bring others along as it, as it, as it serves this time. Yeah, I think it's awesome. So congratulations to you. I'm so excited Thank to you. see. Uh, I can't wait for Jerry and I to open this beauty plaza here, Jerry. So um, thank you so much for your time today. We can't wait to have you on. And again, celebrating <laughs> our fifth year uh, with our podcast. It's fantastic. We can't wait to see where you go and what you're doing next. Thank you guys so much for having me. And I just want to um, take a quick minute to say thanks to Andrea uh, for, for letting me help with her brand and kind of carry uh, carry that baby over here into the U.S. It's a real privilege and um, I just feel honored. I will uh, take all responsibilities very seriously and um, I'm grateful for the friendship uh, from both of you ladies. So thanks so much. Thanks, Meg. Hey, franchise owners. How is your local marketing? Do you feel like you could use some help keeping up with your social media posts and comments and reviews? Do you wonder if you could be doing more to attract local customers? Are you able to identify new move-ins to your local area? At Westvine, we help franchisees like you reach more local customers through digital marketing. With daily monitoring, creative content, and ad placement, and customer data intelligence, We'll get your business in front of the people who want your products or services. We also work with franchisors who need an agency to handle the digital marketing for all of their locations. If you're ready to reach more local customers, give us a call at 805-265-5440 or visit us at westvine.com. That's 805-265-5440 or westvine with a Y dot com. Yay, here we are. My two people who've been gone, what feels like forever. You're so yeah. sweet. It's so nice to be back and to be able to come back with Andrea. You know, I got to tell you, though, being on here with Meg and Andrea at the same time, and they're doing their makeup and all those kinds of things. And I'm sitting here thinking this picture makes me look fat. I'm going to have to do something about <laughs> placing my camera from now on. You guys are I don't know if you're bad or good for me, but uh, I, I'm paying more attention. Fat and old, dude. <laughs> Fat and old. <laughs> Worry you about know, the gray hair. Have lashes and I don't know, Jerry. Lip gloss. Lip gloss. <laughs> you know, it's funny because uh, Andrea, when you saw me going on main stage before I had to do that, I literally had to go for makeup in the back. And oh. <laughs> I haven't done that since college drama, you know, so it's been a long time. But it was kind of funny that to Kristen's point, they did put on a little stuff to make you not shine in the lights and things like that. And then she looked at my hair and she says, oh, Jerry's got great hair. I don't have to do anything with his hair. I'll just let him go on stage with that. So I did something right. There you go. I don't think they would have known where to start with mine. <laughs> <laughs> so let's oh. be honest. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. Oh my gosh. So you guys have got to have some great stories coming back from IFA and in Vegas. Oh, I didn't know we were telling those stories, but um, <laughs> okay. okay, those are the dark stories. We should okay. start with the lighter stories. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was it was great. I I mean I was I I don't I had heard it was the most well attended IFA. Um, mm -hmm. I think there were 4,400 or more attendees. Well, good. No which, one missed me. That's good. <laughs> um, no, well, they missed you. Yeah. Um, and, and I thought that was really, really great. And I thought the format was different this year in that um, it seemed like there was more time that was a bit open. And maybe it was the way that they had that app designed to really. Um, you know, integrate and meet with other people and build that into your schedule. So I thought that was, I thought that was better than in past years where you just felt like you were rushing. Yeah, Andrea, I agree. The app was much better this year than it has been in the past. It felt like there were, I don't know if there were gaps or it was just better organized or clearer about which uh, session you might want to go to or something like that, but it did feel a lot. Well, 
I'd like to say it was a lot less stressful, but for me, it was very stressful because they were moving me from meeting to meeting the whole time I was there. But uh, I did notice on the app when I was trying to make it to sessions that I could attend, it was much better put together. And I give kudos to um, IFA for listening to us because, you know, that's feedback we've all given them over the years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, we, we kind of queued this up before you both left about franchisees and getting involved with IFA. And Jerry, you talked a little bit about that you were going to be doing um, a, a class or whatever you want to call it about um, IFAs. I'm sorry, franchisees at IFA. Can you talk a little bit about what it was that you discussed and some of the subject matter that you think franchisees would have been able to bring back with them if they had attended this year? Absolutely. You know, Kristen, one of the, some of the feedback we've gotten at the franchisee level over the last two or three years is that, and to Andrew's point, sometimes it's tough to figure out which session is best suited for a franchisee. And there weren't enough sessions for franchisees. So a lot of franchisees would go there and then they'd come back and give us feedback that they didn't know if they would come again. They didn't know if there was enough, you know, information to take back that they could put into play in their business to make it worthwhile. So we took that seriously. So there's two or three things I can talk about, but the franchisee forum is the third leg of the IFA group. And that is where franchisees have a chance to talk about franchisee issues and actually have us carry that information forward to the executive board to get more education, more support, all of those kinds of things for franchisees. Well, at our convention forum meeting this year, we actually had four great speakers come in at the forum meeting. So the forum business was like 10 minutes out of an hour and a half meeting, and the rest of it was speakers who spoke about things related to franchisees. We had a gentleman from, I always get these acronyms wrong, Fifth Third Bank, I believe is what okay. it is, who came in to talk about different financing options, uh, new and innovative fi uh, financing options for franchisees to take advantage of as they wanted, if they wanted to get their first location or expand or acquire or whatever the case might be. Okay. Uh, we had uh, we had somebody from SBA come in that had some comments about how much they were listening to franchisees and they were going to make it much easier for franchisees to get loans. One of the things I can tell you specifically that I took away from that speaker was they're going to give more uh, authority to the local lender than they really? ever have in the past because the local lender knows you and your business and the climate in that area better than somebody in DC does. So they're going to smooth that out and, and give a lot more credit to, because I know I've been in a situation where a lender would love to give me money, but there was some little box that didn't get checked for SBA. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. they're doing away with that, which was very powerful. Um, we had a lady. Down, Gary. I wrote that down. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I hope there's a lot of listeners writing this kind of stuff yeah. down. It's, it's some of the stuff they miss and I'm not going to do it justice, but, but that's kind of a, you know, just a tidbit of the four speakers that we had that were very, very powerful. Uh, I can tell you franchisees took a lot from those. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing, and by the way, we started a quarterly uh, franchisee seminar session, a learning platform where we're going to have speakers like I just discussed come in and spend an hour uh, for every franchisee that wants to be on there and learn about that subject. Uh, of course, uh, IFA is a great magazine. Uh, there's going to be an article from the franchisee side of things every every uh, uh, issue that comes out. So we're really listening. We're trying to give more back to the franchisee side. And the way I look at it, because as you know, I'm one of the drivers of this thing, along with a few of my friends that are franchisees. And uh, um, we have more volume as franchisees than the franchisors and suppliers yeah. do. And yeah. we love our franchisors and our suppliers, but at the same time, we need more franchisees to be involved, but franchisees have to be able to get something from it to make it worth their while. So we're working really hard to get that all in place. And I see Andrea shaking her head. So I think she's got some things she wants to comment on about that. Before, well, I mean, I think you are absolutely right. I think multi-unit convention also provides, you know, some of the content that you're speaking to, but unless you're big enough to attend something like that, there may not be the kind of value that you're speaking about here, but you brought up um, suppliers. And I, you know, I, I really have felt like over the past couple of years, the more 
joint employer issues that have come up and the sensitivity that the franchisors feel. And it actually impacts in a negative way the franchisees because they're yeah. not always getting the support they need out of fear the franchisors have of doing something that might down the road create some kind of an issue. And so the opportunity that I think I see here where maybe there's a way to um, kind of bridge the gap here is with the suppliers who can kind of to some extent be that buffer between the franchisor and the franchisee where they, they're not only sort of an extension of maybe the overhead of both without necessarily being real overhead of either. Andrea, and then they're also supporting. Are you talking more of the HR uh, supportive vendors, the ones that help with payroll and uh, work comp and those types of things? Because I've met some of those not too long ago. Are those the ones you're referring to? It could be. It could be that. It could be in operational support where, you know, a supplier might be able to provide best practices or recommendations that okay. in some cases a franchisor might be more sensitive about. HR is a great example for sure. Yep. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, I think suppliers have, have the good suppliers and I'm involved with one, Woven Brands, as you know. I mean, I yep. think they've really stepped up and just been able to fill that void and, and it gets recognized by franchisees. I mean, that's, that's a supplier that's grown to date by franchisee adoption. And that is very yeah. difficult to do in franchising. So um, I think, I think there's something there that is worth digging into. Andrea, so sorry, Andrea, you're spot on. Uh, HR is the big bugaboo. It's the one that's the skeleton in the closet. The franchisors are totally petrified of because yep. of the joint employer thing. Uh, but because of that, many franchisors and franchisees ignore the fact that there's so much other uh, education on operations and best practices and, and even back office type things that uh, vendors can help educate on or the franchise, uh, you know, IFA and the franchisee forum can help with. So giving them those opportunities to fill in that gap. And the problem we've got is it was ma it's mainly large franchisees that know of the availability of all of that extra support. So right. getting the word out through a, very, a variety of different metrics to get mm -hmm. to those smaller franchisees is critical. Well, yeah. and, and here's the key. So you've got a lot of people who are in a space, you know, I, I'm one that's in a space where I'm sketchy about if I grow much more, I'm going to cross over that threshold of the number of employees. And then the rules for me change, right? right. And so, and, and I've talked to a lot of franchisees who go, well, I kind of want to stymie my growth because if I, if I click over to X number of employees, if I go over 50, my rules change and I don't want to play by those rules. And so it gets really interesting when you start into that larger company dynamic and then you hit other thresholds and other rules change. So right. It's really interesting. You guys brought up some really great topics. So for our franchisee friends out there who are listening, where do they go to get recaps of all of this information? I mean, it's not the IFA is a great place to start because one of the things that I think both of us have sort of said is that the benefit of working with a supplier that's affiliated with IFA or is an IFA member is they're working with franchisees and franchisors. So they understand the industry working with a supplier that doesn't understand franchising. And I've definitely done it as a franchisor and also on contract for other companies. It's, it's painful because you think you have the right tool or the right support, but they've, they don't understand franchising. So IFA, you know, using a supplier that is on the list, they would have to go through a number of, a uh, number of tests and points to be able to be in with IFA. So that to me would be a good starting point. Jerry can give lots more. Well, uh, just go to the IFA website because they're going to be selling the videos from all and or any number of the sessions. So if anything we've spoken of or even something we haven't of just it makes us make sense and you want more information, go to the IFA website and get that. It'll also give a list of the vendors. So if there's something on there that, you know, there's a niche that you're missing, you need support in, as Andrea said, they're, uh, they're vetted. In fact, I can tell you from the board standpoint, we're doing more vetting now than ever before, not only on suppliers, but on franchisors. 
Yeah. Because we want to ensure that, you know, by them being a member, we're kind of putting our name behind that uh, supplier or franchisor. And we do not want to be portrayed as leading a potential franchisee down the wrong path. So the vetting process has gone up. IFA uh, website's the number one place to go to for all of that stuff. Excellent. And obviously we'll have links on our website and uh, Fred will get a lot of that updated to our blog and things of that nature. Any big surprises um, or big takeaways that either one of you had aside from what we've already talked about that you'd like to discuss? I don't know if it's a big surprise, but I think, you know, I've gone to a couple of smaller events, still sanctioned, but um, there's, there's kind of two observations I've made in the last, I would say year one is there's, there's definitely a lot more private equity looking at franchise brands. And I, I think I'm glad that they were at IFA because I think if they don't understand franchising and a lot of them don't, I, I, I do feel worried about franchisees and how private equity could impact, um, the franchisee relationship because it's very different than coming into a company that's got a lot of corporate locations and wanting to grow a, a system like that. So, you know, in a way um, there, there almost needs to be like some kind of role between private equity and franchising where there's like a driver or a guide that helps them navigate like, okay, this system, you know, you need to focus here and work there. there. There, I just saw a bit of an opportunity there and talking to some of the different private equity groups that I met with, just happened to have conversations with. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing I observed, and I'm sure you did too, Jerry, is there's so many platform companies popping up, Fran Worth that Meg is involved with is one. And so I think what's going to start to happen, and it's starting a little bit now, is they're going to become, they have to differentiate now. And so I think we're going to see a shift where they become laser focused on the types of brands that they have in that platform so that they can they can be different than the one next door. Otherwise, it's just going to become based on, you know, who gives them the best terms if they're a franchisor. So I think I think that's going to shift a little bit. And I see a lot of value. I mean, my brand joined um, and I exited, but joined a company, a platform company. And then there was lots of value there. Let um, me ask but- you something on that, Andrea. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Because a lot of those platform companies wind up being bought by private equity. Yeah, they do. It, and and so I, that yeah. gets kind of dicey, right? I don't know. I think, the, I think what's happening there is they're probably, private equity is probably seeing maybe some of the same observations that I had where to go in and try and create change or grow with a franchisor if they aren't if they don't have a big enough team or support network or management structure to do that then it's a lot more of an investment for them to do to make that happen yeah. whereas a platform company is economizing their their people across the different brands that they have like Franworth has great people and they can leverage them where they need to in the different brands they have in their portfolio. And there's lots of value to the brands for that. So I can see why private equity would, would do that. I want to tag team on a couple of things that Andrea said there. Uh, and first off, let me start out with, I have never been a fan of private equity, but to Andrea's point, I learned a lot at this convention about private equity. And I do not look at them as I would in the past, which is kind of the Wolf of Wall Street, you know, approach. It's more like they're just another investor or lender getting in. And frankly, um, to your point, Kristen, you know, them buying up some of these franchise related suppliers and so on, I think only strengthens those companies and makes them better for the franchising world. And, and I will just uh, add to that, uh, it helps that one of my best friends who has been a franchisee for 25 years, and I think you know him, Kristen, we'll get to that later, uh, <laughs> now owns a private equity firm that only buys fr- into franchisee, uh, franchises. So um, I, I'm, very, I'm very much more uh, um, in line in tune with private equity being a part of this now. Yeah. Not each of them is created equal. Anybody that's thinking about joining with somebody uh, in that 
area probably needs to do some research and make sure you know they're not going to buy your whole company we don't want to be uh like shark tank and they own 99 percent right. of your company but still um <laughs> if, if what i think what i see and i'm thinking from my friend's company standpoint but i think a lot of others out there they understand that it's not bricks and mortar most lenders are still stuck in that little niche they understand that you're going to be underwater for x number of months or years until you make money and they're willing to go on that ride with you so I, I think, I don't want to go too far, but I think they can be a positive uh, method of people expanding and growing and so on without uh, losing that momentum. One of my biggest takeaways, and it goes to the trade show as much as anything else, you would not believe how many vendors we had there that, uh, that were in the technology field and IT for sure, but AI. Oh, yeah. AI had a huge uh, section there. And there were classes on AI and how it's going to influence franchising and so on. And I'm old, so <laughs> AI is still science fiction to me, but then they start sharing some of the things that AI is, AI is already doing in franchising and how they see it expanding. It is mind blowing. So again, people that didn't go there because they didn't think they would get anything, you missed a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Well, and I like that, you, as you said, uh, if you did, if you did not get to go, go to the IFA website, download whatever you can. Um, the last question I had for both of you is, were there any presentations that IFA did on cause-based marketing? Well, I do not think there was anything specific, uh, like no panels or any of those kinds of things, but I would almost guarantee they had round tables set up to talk about that because that's where I met Fred. Look at him laughing. That's where I met Fred the first time yeah. many years ago. I was running a table about that, and I have seen that pretty much every year since I've been going, so I would bet there was. Uh, and typically, those tables are very well intended, usually overflow. People are pulling in chairs from other tables to get there, so I would almost guarantee there were some of those. Well, I want to thank both of you. I'm sure you I, I'm sure that you both suffered the entire time you were in Vegas. I'm sure it was very difficult those few days that you were there. But I want to thank you for going and taking one for the team <laughs> um, and coming back and sharing all those great thoughts. Um, I really appreciate you guys being out there and being a voice and eyes and ears for us. So, um, again, welcome back. We're glad you made it safe and sound and nobody came back sick. So that's a good thing. And uh, we want to thank everybody for for the work that you do for us every single week. So thank you very much. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you. And as we uh, conclude our show today, we'd like to thank uh, our fabulous guest, Miss Meg Roberts for joining us on the show today. And as I search for my notes here, uh, we'd also like to thank Jerry Akers, Andrea Mundy, as they've come back from uh, Las Vegas with all their great feedback. Ray is off somewhere in Arkansas today. So thank you, Ray, for all that you're doing out there in the box. Our producer, uh, Fred, who's there in the background making all those crazy noises. I am Kristen Shelmetsy, and together we are your resource for franchising success. This has been yet another episode of Pillars of Franchising, and we are your resource for franchising success. And remember, the dream starts here. We'll see you next week, Thursday, 4 p.m. Central. Have a great week. Thank you for using Blog Talk Radio. Goodbye.